guys, did you catch this list? Well, you should, since it breaks down what we're basically doing here. But in case you're not caught up, a brief recap. Got a lot of albums to talk about, so I split the usual list into two videos. Last video was the shit, and this video is the legit. 20 albums of the year and 15 honorable mentions this time out. A lot of ground to cover, so let's not waste any time. Harry Styles, Crash, what kind of blasphemy is- No! Get that shit out of my house. Yeah, no, it's not like I was a big fan of One Direction back in the day. Fuck, I couldn't stand them. I don't really do the boy band thing, either ironically or otherwise, and... Nobody can drag me down. Yeah, whatever, not my thing. And now that they've all gone solo, I originally couldn't have cared less about what they were doing. Especially after I heard that weird Zane thing back in the day. What the fuck is a Zane? But the thing is, I kept getting recommendations for this album, and even some of my other critical peeps told me that this was something that I should definitely check out, and once I caved, yeah, holy shit, I gotta admit, they were right. This kid has talent. A slow, somber, heartbreaking little affair, Harry Styles really put out a grippingly soulful little slow burn. It's so good that I've weirdly found myself coming back to this album over and over again throughout the year. I came about this close to reviewing it on the channel, but just couldn't get around to it due to time obligations. Like. I really dig this, like sincerely. It's debatable whether or not this even falls into my jurisdiction, for sure, but one thing that's not as debatable, Styles has legit chops. I can't wait to see what this kid has in store next. Legit, Harry, I'm on board, man. Keep it coming, dude. Seriously, what the fuck is a Zane? Another great debut, The Regrets, really impressed me this year with Feel Your Feelings, Fool. A beautifully kick-ass little riot girl band in the vein of La Tigra or Bratmobile, with a more modern take on the genre, and a blissfully hooky and infectious sensibility to their music. The Regrets are impressive just on the music alone, but the fact that these gals and guy aren't even out of high school yet is, like, doubly impressive. You know, we got a surprising amount of great girl punk this year, as you'll see as the list goes on, but it's nice to see the more old school, more classical vein of this genre can still be pulled off well, and it's nice to see it still has a place in 2017. These gals and guy, god that's awkward to say, may be young, but they have a lot of chutzpah, plenty of kick ass, and boatloads of potential. Look, given that Riot Girl is a genre I'm always happy to be hearing from, I can't wait to hear what these girls and guy have in store next. The Full Blast. Can't say I was originally familiar with these guys. Apparently this melodic punk act from Ontario. Holy shit, another amazing band from Ontario? How the hell does this province keep cranking out such killer acts? Was originally active from 2000 to 2006, but they came back from the dead in 2017 to release this EP of new material, and I will summarize my experience with the band like this. The Full Blast is probably one of the most aptly named bands I've ever reviewed. Holy shit, this music is completely off the rails. The guitar melodies are punchy and lightning fast. The bass is thick, deep, and punishing. The drum beats are so forceful and intense, it feels like the earth is gonna split beneath your feet while you listen. Guys, this shit is intense. Full blast, you could say. I've always said that an EP needs to kick a lot of ass in order to be featured on my show, but man, Attack, Sustain, Decay was so good, my only real complaint is that at 15 minutes, it simply wasn't enough. For fans of stuff like Strike Anywhere or a Wilhelm Scream, you have to pick this up, like, immediately. Hey, full blast, are you guys sure you want to call it quits with this? Because... Uh, Holy hell, I'd love to hear more from you if you got it in you dudes, this thing was great. Yup, Tooth Grinders making the list. I dug it. Like I mentioned in the last video, 2017 was a year where a ton of bands made massive 180 degree turns away from their usual sound and style to bring us a lot of new and interesting interpretations of their sound. In some cases... This went very poorly, but here I'd say it paid off for the better. Way better. Toothgrinder's previous album was 
okay, but to bring things down a notch and to chill out their sound and go more blissful and ethereal seems to have really paid off well for them here. This is a wonderful little album to pop on when you want to chill out, but still want something hard, heavy, and metallic. It's a strange mood to be in, but it's nice to hear an album that doesn't have to sacrifice one style in order to meet another. Another pleasant surprise in 2017, a year that, from a musical standpoint, was full of pleasant surprises. You heard me say it, I am down with the ghost love. You know, I really did enjoy this album, but man, you know we had a good year when I have no choice but to relegate something like this to the honorable mentions. But seriously, this was another fine outing from the Rise Against crew. Loud, angry, powerful, and melodic, it's maybe one of those albums that doesn't deviate too much from the formula or see them straying too far outside of their comfort zone, but uh, even when Rise Against is playing it safe, they still have so much panache, substance, and oomph to their music. I just can't help but be sold. It's a very solid album. And again, as the nightmare orange babies term continues to spiral towards implosion, I'm always going to be on the lookout for those strong, loud, and capable voices happy to chant a good old fuck you back at the fascist fuckboy and his sycophantic dick-sucking brigade. And while acts like Prophets of Rage were disappointing, believe me, I got plenty of acts like these guys to help fill in the gaps that Prophets might have left with some of you. Look, don't worry, Papa Crash has you covered, homies. Yeah, when I first heard this album, I was like every other critic and their cat. I loved it. I adored it. It's a gorgeous, stunning powerhouse of an album, drenched in the sweetest of melodies and some of the most exquisitely executed production and instrumentation of the entire year. It's a triumph for Father John and another fine chapter into the book of an artist who is likely to have one of the more legendary careers of this decade. I do really, really like this album. Believe me, I do. That's why it's on the list. Though if I'm being completely transparent with you, it's not one I found myself coming back to too terribly often. Oh, look, I got nothing, nothing but respect for Misty as a musician. But as a songwriter and a lyricist, Jesus fucking Christ, his cynicism and relentlessly bleak outlook can be a little much, especially this year where all of his lyrics were basically just ripped right out of the headlines, and especially with an album like this that eclipses 74 minutes of this sardonic mess. Yeah, yeah, look, I get it, Werner Herzog. Life is pain. All is shit. Humanity is meaningless. Everyone will die cold, hungry, and alone. Life is pain. I get it, dude. I get it. I super fucking get it. Can you just like chill for a bit? Can, can you chill? Can you please fucking chill? Pretty please? Don't misinterpret me. This album was great and it totally deserves all of the praise it's getting. All of it. But for me personally, especially this year, it was like one of those gigantic novelty candy bars you find in like gas stations and stuff. Look, I love the fuck out of Reese's Cups, but I can't eat those motherfuckers that are like a pound. Like what the fuck am I supposed to do with that much? A great album, miserable year for it. Still gets on the best list. So hey, more power to you. Just. Somebody give this man a hug already, would ya? What the hell is this? Completely gibberish sounding name? Pretty anime boy on the cover who looks like he's a Final Fantasy XV DLC character? Crash, are you back on your J-Rock bullshit again? Uh, maybe? But my rebuttal to that statement is this. <laughs> yeah, dude. Bloodstained Child is so legit, and I'm so glad they dropped something this year so I would finally have the chance to talk about them. This is some of the coolest melodic death metal to come out of Japan in a while. I often use clips from their other work in my videos. Hell, I used one of their songs last time I went Super Saiyan. And man, even though this was just a super short EP, all 14 minutes of this thing are pure thrashy bliss. This is Mellow Death of the In Flames, Children of Bottom 
variety, where it's like all intensity all the damn time, but it's got just the right peppering of electronica and even trance and dance elements to give it a certain unique and vibrant sort of tastiness to it. Like, it's very palatable for music that's so edgy. Even if you aren't into harder music, I'd recommend at least giving this a shot. These songs are like the kick-ass opening theme songs to anime series that don't even exist yet. If it piques your interest, I cannot recommend these guys highly enough. No idea who the anime boy is on the cover. Sundara Karma. A complete shot in the dark for me back when I reviewed it. Last January, when I finished the countdown videos early, I was just randomly poking around for stuff to review, and since the last Dropkick Murphys didn't give me shit to talk about, I took a chance on these new guys. And you know what? I'm super glad I did, because their music just kept popping up over and over again as I progressed throughout the year. These guys basically sound like all the best parts of acts like the 1975 or Arcade Fire, except stripped of all the wanking, meaningless fucking about of the former, or the head buried so far up its own ass it needs to review its spew-lunking license between each release pretentiousness of the Ladder, a terrific pop rock group that doesn't really have a lot of baggage or bullshit, they just love making good music, and their debut was a really strong one, particularly in a year full of strong debuts. Again, this came out in January, and while it wasn't always in the forefront of my thoughts, the colorful melodies and catchy hooks always stuck out somewhere in the back of my mind throughout 2017. Great debut from this band. I hope it means we're getting better things in store for the near future. Another British act on this list, and believe me, it is far from our last. My god, did we get a lot of great music out of the UK this year, especially in rock. And weirdly enough, a metric fuck ton of that good music was pop punk of all genres. Well, a lot of it was being imported from across the pond. I guess we should enjoy it now before Brexit chokes off all the good British imports. Does that joke even makes sense. I don't even know at this point. I should cool it with the topical shit. Um, Red, Green, and In Between was a fascinating little pop-punk experiment with some absolutely exquisite guitar and percussion work that just melted my brain with how scrumptiously dulcet it all was. Whereas other big pop-punk releases for the year, like Neck Deep and As It Is, came off as... Not good, but not great. Waster was one of those pop punk bands that really stood out to me. In a sea of great pop punk, these guys made a hell of a name for themselves on this full length debut. Though, trust me, this is far from the only pop punk act we'll be seeing on this list, so uh, don't worry. If anything, I'm like stuffed for pop punk this year. Jesus Christ. I told you it was gonna be on this list. So, me. Yeah. Hey, what can I say? I am a supremely easy lay for their kind of post-hardcore, post-emo, flannel-clad variety of punk shenanigans, but this is truly a band that makes it so easy to love them. Light It Up was another wonderful collection of soulful lyrics, intense guitar melodies, and some of the thickest, saltiest, sharpest combinations of grit and substance you can find still alive in the scene today. It's like if your own hangover could deliver Shakespearean soliloquies to you while you pour your coffee the morning after. It's fucking great. And while this album is really good, it doesn't quite measure up to some of their other previous works, but really, that's why it makes the honorable mentions as opposed to the list proper, but man, really even that is only because the band's previous body of work is just so goddamn hard to top. It'd have to be another punk album of the damn decade in order for them to outdo themselves here. This may not be their best album, but this record, along with the rest of their catalog, still comes very, very highly recommended. Oh, thank God, somebody from AFI did something right. Oh, whew, holy shit, I was getting worried there for a second. Ha! Uh, yeah, guys, after the Blood album lost me so hard earlier in the year, my original optimism towards this side project, featuring Davey Havoc, along with the non-Stefani guys from No Doubt, drained out of me like... 
blood from a wound. Wow, how meta. Uh, but thankfully, this album turned out to be really, really, really damn solid. This absolutely scrumptious little 80s pop fiesta really stuck out in a year that was so full of dank, dark, and dismal sounding music. And even though it was a bright and colorful little romp, it still had just that littlest twinge of darkness and the macabre to it, thanks in part to Davy's lyrics. Cause he's a spooky boy! But yeah, this was a fun little experiment, a nice crossbreeding of two band sounds to create something wholeheartedly new and engaging. If 2017 was just too absolutely depressing for you, well, this album will still sound depressing, but it's like a pleasant, vibrant, and neon-colored kind of depressing. It's depression with cool sunglasses. Come on. Another album kind of similar to Tooth Grinders in some ways, in that it was ferocious and crazy intense when it wanted to be, but also stunningly chill and eerily mellow when it took the time to slow down a bit. This was an album that played with a lot of different types of dynamics and soundscapes, and it pulled off pretty much everything it did absolutely blissfully. An extremely well-executed record, a dark and sinister album with some absolutely killer guitar work on it, and a vocalist that could switch on a dime between pleasant-sounding clean singing and gore-fueled high-register shrieks. Reminder was one of those instances where I knew nothing of the band going in, but after hearing them, I just had to know more. I'm a little surprised a band this good hasn't really caught on yet, but hopefully by the time their next recording drops, more of you will be on this train so that you'll be able to enjoy what they put out next. I would love to see this band get more attention, so yeah, another album you probably missed in 2017 that you should totally get around to when you can. This is your reminder. Wow, my jokes are really bad this time out, aren't they? I give up. Again, we have another solid girl band on the list. Yeah, this was one hell of a ride. These gals are an absolutely kick-ass, straightforward, punch-in-the-gut kind of modern rock sound with just enough punk sensibilities and attitude to stand out, but not too much as to alienate those who are immediately frightened off by the old Mohawks and Doc Martens. A wonderful example of the genre that would fit right at home on your local rock radio helm or your favorite satellite radio station, for example. This band has legit mainstream potential. On my initial review, I wasn't quite so warm to them, but really it was hearing feedback from you guys on this one that really helped push me over the edge. I got so many people telling me, oh my god Crash, thank you so much for recommending this band to me. This was another outstanding record from an up and coming band that has a lot of potential I don't even think they've begun to tap into yet. So seriously, Dollskin, really looking forward to album number three from you guys. Oh, and uh, forgive me for not realizing immediately off the bat that Uninvited was an Alanis Morissette cover, especially from a 90s kid like me. Yeah, even I gotta admit, that's a pretty big goof. My bad. I suck. Whoo, this band. This band really impressed me this year. Again, this was one of those albums that took a while to grow on me, but the more spins I've had with it, the more things i found to enjoy about this record. Oh man, I can't say I blame anyone for having to give these guys more than a few goes before really getting into them. Proto Martyr! They are a hell of a unique band, aren't they? Their music is moody, dark, and elegantly composed, but it has this wonderful post-punky kind of edge and sheen to it. It has all the intelligence and narrative focus of something like R.E.M. or The National, but has just the right amount of bravado, swagger, and punch to keep itself distinct and force itself out of the doldrums that acts like those can often find themselves in. Its exquisite drum work, fuzzy, earth-shaking bass tones, and Joe Casey's densely layered lyrics and subdued yet enticing delivery make this band supreme extremely interesting. They're a band of a lot of interesting contradictions. They're powerful yet dignified, charismatic yet mysterious, forceful but not overpowering in any sense. It's really just something you gotta hear for yourself. But once you do, I think most of you will get it. After like three or four spins. I'll bet there's a fair amount of you weirded out that this is only an honorable mention as opposed to being on the list proper, but 
like I said in my original review, I really did enjoy this album. I liked it a lot, but... Oh, it wasn't exactly the life-changing, spellbinding, mystifying musical orgasm machine I was quite expecting it to be. Though, to be fair, how could it be? I think a lot of us probably had our expectations a wee tiny bit too high for this one. But come on, for as long as this band was out of commission and as glorious as their previous body of work was, I... how could we not? Come on, this is at the drive-in, people! Even if this album didn't bring about the second coming of Emo Jesus, the fact that we even have it at all is surprising enough, and the guys? Hell, they were still able to deliver a damn solid record full of gravitas, fervor, and some of the catchiest licks and hooks this side of the original turn of the century. Omar and Cedric are as lithe and nimble and kookily creative as ever. Paul and Tony continue to deliver their roles on the rhythm section, and even though the classic riffage of Jim Ward was missed on this outing, Keely Davis did a fine job holding his own. Inter alia despite its flaws, was still a wonderful return for ATDI, and again, in a year like 2017, it was always nice to see miracles happen, and getting a new ATDI, that's a miracle I sure as hell never expected to see. Whew, god damn, that was a lot of good stuff, and we're only just out of the honorable mentions. I mean, what can I tell you? I listened to and reviewed a lot of stuff this time around, and 2017 was a weirdly good ass year for a lot of music. So buckle up people cause this roller coaster has 20 goddamn loops in it. Starting with, uh, you guys know me, I am a sucker, an absolute sucker for cute shit. And Diet Sig is like one of the cutest goddamn bands I've ever come across. And uh, actually, now that I think about it, I should probably clarify this statement a little. I don't mean that in like a condescending or a mean-spirited kind of way, like, oh, aren't you cute? No, 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 I, I genuinely mean it as the sincerest kind of compliment. Maybe cute is the wrong word to be using here. What this band has isn't exactly cuteness, per se. What it is, is charm with their frank and quirky lyrics, the simple but interesting instrumentation, and the absolutely high energy and high fun factor that they pour into every track and performance, these guys just ooze with character. This kind of thing may not be everyone's cup of tea, but goddamn, you can't deny they're a band with a unique and a damn intriguing identity. And given the oodles upon oodles of samey, fuzzed out, fake blues, white stripe wannabe duo ass duos I had to listen to this year. It burned like this was best, so back sucking on Christ day. Sucking balls, sucking balls, sucking balls, sucking balls, 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 balls. I was so happy to find one of them willing to think outside the box a little bit. Hey, good job, Diet Sig. I look forward to hearing you on the soundtrack of the next big indie film at Sundance. Again, Britain had a stellar year in music, especially in pop punk, and Brighton's Gospel Youth absolutely killed it on their debut. Holy shit, this has been a good year for debuts, too. Like, oh my god, I have nine debut albums on this list. God damn. Soulful and excellently played pop punk that's dense, meaty, and absolutely scrumptious. For those of you that prefer your pop punk to have just that little extra bit of proficiency and not just, you know, cool haircuts and power chords, this is a band for you to check out. Once you hear Sam Little's pipes, I promise you, you'll be hooked. This dude right here is what pushed these guys over the edge for me. My guy is an absolute belter. He gets damn near close to guys like Brendan Yuri and Gerard Way with his level of force and vocal intensity. This dude is a hell of a singer, and he can deliver one hell of a performance. And with a band this capable behind him, you will be absolutely sold on this particular gospel pretty damn quickly. Oh, God damn it! I do love me some good ass power metal. Loincloths, broadswords, artwork that looks like Boris Vallejo bukkakeed all over the broadside of a 70s panel van. Yeah, dude, I'm down for that. And Battle Beast had to be one of the best power metal albums we got all year. They brought it hard and heavy on Bringer of Pain, which 
Given the album's title, I'd have probably been due for a refund had they not. Uh, what I like most about this band is just how flawlessly they walk that power metal tightrope. You know the one I'm talking about. Every power metal band has to walk it, and it's not an easy one to cross. Most bands either find themselves dipping off to one side and being so goddamn silly that they basically come off as parodies of themselves, while many others tumble off the other side and take themselves so goddamn seriously they become no fucking fun. But with stellar instrumentation, terrific stage presence and presentation, and Nora Luhimo's trademark blistering cries of violence and vengeance and slaughter, this band makes walking that particular power metal tightrope look damn near simple. Call these guys up and get you some pain brought to you. Trust me on this one, it's worth the delivery charge. Man, I'll bet this one is another shocking one to see, at least this low on the list, but guys, legit, I just have so many good albums to choose from that poor old Roger here just kinda got muscled from the tippy top as the year went on, but please don't let that dissuade you from this album. This thing was exceptionally outstanding. Another brilliant work from a brilliant musician. I said it in my original review, and I'll bloody well say it again. This is what the last Pink Floyd album should have sounded like. Full of genuine pathos, emotional resonance, and stark, biting commentary on the socio-political landscape of the day, Waters delivers a truly gripping unsettling album that gets under your skin precisely because he's singing from a place of truth and relevancy. As opposed to just, you know, clubbing you over the head repeatedly with ennui. Yes, Tillman, yes, we get it. To breathe is to weep. We are the all-singing, all-dancing shit of the universe. I promise I will read your live journal in the trees later. Just c come on, dude, come on. To me, Waters really was the heart and soul of Pink Floyd, and to see that he's been able to keep that heart pumping for roughly 32 years now just makes this album all the more impressive. And I finally did get around to listening to the Butt album. The Butt album was pretty good. It was a good butt. I enjoyed it. Has it ever been made clear at any point that I like melodic death metal? Like, at any point? Have I ever, like, randomly mentioned that ever on this channel? Ever? Because I do really love me some good melodic death metal. And Black Dahlia Murder is about as good as they come, at least from this side of the Atlantic anyway. Black Dahlia is just one of those bands that always delivers super hard. Abysmal made my top metal albums list over on Metal Sucks, and I remember in that review I said something like this. Oh, yeah. Have these guys ever put out a bad album? And, yeah, motherfuckers, they still got a perfect slate. what it do? Fuck, Black Dahlia rules. Nightbringers was just pure, unbridled, unrestricted chaos. And unlike the last time I had to use that phrase, this time I actually do mean it as a compliment. This, like any BDM album, was a record that just rips and tears at your guts. The soloing shrieks and soars, the bass growls and rattles, the drums absolutely pulverize, and vocalist Trevor Stunad? How the fuck is that not a typo, for real? Uh, just peels the paint off the walls with his screaming. Even the departure of guitarist Ryan Knight couldn't stop these guys from delivering, as new guy Brandon Ellis fills in the lead position quite nicely. Again, it may not be surprising that a Black Dahlia Murder album kicked ass, but... Yeah, this Black Dahlia Murder album kicked ass. Fucking raise them. God damn it, Crash, more of this wakisaki moon language anime as fuck kuai desu nipponichi paki stuffed Japanese bullshit. I ain't into your weeaboo hijinks, Thompson. Okay, A, shut up. And B, again, my rebuttal to that statement is this. Yeah, Bandmade is another one of those J-Rock acts that people in the know love ranting and raving about, and I'm here to tell you that all that raving you may have heard about this band is legit. These gals kick major ass. Bandmade is a no BS, straightforward, classic rock rooted kind of band, and Just Bring It is 13 tracks of pure energy, pure chutzpah, pure punch in the goddamn face rock and roll. And hey, you know, some people pay good money to have women dressed like this punch them in the face, so I hope you appreciate how good this band really is. 
And yeah, cheesy Japanese gimmick is super cheesy. I get it. Look, cheesy gimmicks are just something you gotta learn to see past if you're gonna get into J-Rock, but Bandmate does an excellent job of constructing their sound from both the classic rock standards as well as more modern influences. They're just as much ACDC as they are Nirvana, just as much Led Zeppelin as they are Foo Fighters, an outstanding band that's gonna be releasing another new album in February, and yeah, you better believe I'll be tackling that one when I get the chance. Oh boy, this album. Um, I'm super late to the party on this one. This was one of those records I caught while catching up on stuff in December, like I mentioned in the last video. Hey, it wasn't just absolute fucking nightmares I uncovered doing that. There were some real gems, too, and this band is legit one of the more interesting cases I encountered this year. It's a soulful, wrenching, and powerful display of work from a band that just shrieks intensity and bravado. This is an absolutely blissful blend of post-punk, industrial, blues, and soul. It's Alabama Shakes as interpreted via... Rammstein, and I fucking love it. Franklin James Fisher is an absolutely mythical vocalist in lyrics. He writes powerful words and sings them with all the soul, passion, and intensity of James Brown, Aretha Franklin, and Zach De La Roca, all super compressed into one. And my god, the percussion on this thing. Oh, it's so golden. It's beautiful. And it all comes to us by way of Matt Tong? Wait, Matt that Matt Tong from Block Party? Oh, dude, I was wondering where you ended up. Holy shit. Nice to see you landed on your feet, amigo. It's an album that's also, like Proto Martyr, a bit on the challenging side. Truth be told, it did take me a few listens to get into this, but I'll be damned if it isn't growing on me in a very big way. I have a feeling we'll be hearing very big things from these guys in the future. Like, yeah, Algiers has been getting a ton of, like, critic hype, but it's legit. Go for it. Jesus fucking Christ, this album, whoa. This thing came right the fuck out of left field and shocked everybody. I don't think anyone was expecting this album to be as good as it was, or for that matter, to blow up as big as it did. This thing was nominated for a Grammy, for God's sakes. But yeah, man, the hype for this album was real, because Code Orange's Forever was frighteningly good. And I do mean frighteningly, too, because holy hell, this album was unsettling. These guys could give 90s Trent Reznor a run for his money on how well they executed dark, sinister, menacing, and absolutely pitch fucking black tones on this record. While they do an excellent job of mixing in just enough melody and clean harmonies here and there to not completely drown you in the darkness, when this band is on full assault, your goofy ass doesn't have a prayer, motherfucker. Strap the fuck in and get wrecked. See this album right here? This is why I give bands like King 810 and Immure so much shit. They try to be tough, menacing, and scary, but they're just insecurity and psychopathy wearing a scary mask. This album, this is what they do done right. Done so motherfucking right. And for all you knuckleheads about to type in a fucking petulant piss baby tirade on me slaughtering your precious Palmieri senpai, I would ask you instead to take the time you would spend doing that, listening to this album, and then report back to me after you've spun it. I bet your attitude will be a lot more chipper. Or you could just fuck off, that's an option too. You know, let's let's get away from the darkness for a little bit, shall we? And talk about this lovely, peppy little pop rock band. Hey, Paramore, they're super sunshine and giggles, right? Except, oh no, this lovely, chipper little pop rock band's new album is also full of darkness, sadness, and rampaging angst. But yeah, Paramore's most poppy, most vibrant, most blissfully melodious album to date was also one of their most devastating. God damn. Haley Williams went through some really hard times, pun partially intended, in the lead up to this album, and she was not shy at all about opening up and writing lyrics from a very personal and reflective place. It's surprisingly frank and vulnerable, and it's nowhere near as giddy and fun as the self-titled album was, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, but again, 
The band took a big risk in making this record that deviates so drastically from their norm, and it really paid off because After Laughter is an extremely satisfying and pleasing listen. Even though it, like, kind of isn't in a weird way. God damn it, 2017, you made Haley Williams cry! This is the third EP to make the list this year. I promise you, I'm sticking to my guns when it comes to my rules on EPs. I promise you, I am. This one really had to knock my freaking socks off for me to consider placing it here. And god damn it, my socks have been knocked off, sent to the cleaners, washed, dried, flat ironed, and returned to me all in just 20 minutes. God damn, boys. How the hell did you pack this much hell yeah into one small package? Pop punk from the front bottoms, Remo Drive, modern baseball stable. So, you know, sarcastic and snide is all fuck. But given that modern baseball and Remo Drive never seemed to impress me as much as they should have, and front bottoms really disappointed me this year. Look, I'm sorry, I'm still not on board with this thing. I was happy as hell to get this little nugget of joy sent in my Patreon requests, an album so good that again, one of the only bad things I can say about it is that there just isn't enough of it. Guys, please, please get us a full length. Like I said in my original review, if you kickstart that album too, I will totally 100% drop into it. Somebody paid me to hear you guys. It's only fair that I return the favor. Man, you know a band really, really knows how to nail it hard when they release two albums that could be potential albums of the year. In one goddamn year, no less. But no, Masty, I got enough EPs on this list as it is, and I think I might have to enact a one album per band per year rule if shit like this keeps happening. I'm also looking at you, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Uh, look, most of your albums were also really good this year too, but chill the fuck out, guys, son of a bitch. Anyway, Mastodon, like Black Dahlia Murder, in their own weird way, is a metal band that just continuously kicks ass. God, I'm almost convinced that these bands are just straight up incapable of making a bad album. Uh, Though I should really watch my tongue there. Oh, knock on wood, knock on wood. Uh, but hey, Emperor of Sand was another stellar effort from the Mastodon crew. It showed us a side of this band that I didn't even think they were capable of. Sincerity. Like, this album really touches your heartstrings from time to time, with its grippingly tragic narrative and aching, weirdly personal lyrics. Again, listen to a song like Jaguar God and tell me you weren't just full of the feels by the end of it. Emperor of Sand was just another bold experiment from a band that never stops experimenting. And at this point, I'm almost convinced they could do something like a ska album or a swing dance record, and it'd still kick major ass. Unlike something like Train, when this band actually tries to see if they can get away with something, they always do because they always deliver the chops to back it up. Are you taking notes, Monahan? Oh no, you're just stealing more lyrics from Sesame Street. Okay, never mind. Like I've already mentioned, 2017 was the year of the risk, and I don't think anybody took a bigger risk in 2017 than Courage, my love. Uh, well, Suicide Silence, maybe, but that risk didn't pay off. This one super duper did. Courage My Love, when they started out, they were this cool pop punk act out of Kitchener, Ontario. Another Ontario band! How do y'all keep doing it? Seriously, the fuck? that were stirring a maddening level of buzz in the underground due to their exquisite live shows and their amazing proficiency as performers. Especially for being such a young act, a lot of people had their eyes on what these potential pop punk legends in the making were going to do with their sophomore release. And they bring out an electronic dance pop album? What the shit? People should have been screaming betrayal louder than Noah Antweiler at an E3 press conference. But nobody was really doing that, were they? No. You know why? Because this album kicked ass. I did not know what to expect when I walked into this thing, but holy hell, I'll be damned if this album never stopped impressing me. The wonderful sampling, the beautiful synth work, and the 
infectiously danceable beats and rhythms. Holy shit, I knew this band had potential as a pop punk act. I had no idea their well of talent was this deep. Guys, I'm telling you, if you aren't getting into Courage My Love, you are missing the fuck out. You dipshit. How's that for tough love? Like I mentioned, another thing I was happy to see in 2017 was so many kick-ass Riot girl bands floating around out there. Like, how many years am I going to have the privilege of having no less than three bands that fall under that label hit my album of the year list? Seriously. But regardless of what year Warriors would have come out in, it still would have been a heavyweight contender because holy shit does this band fucking slay. Completely unapologetic, old school, fast and furious punk rock with zero fucks given and even less shit taken. This band released some of the most raucous, caustic, and sensationally catchy slam anthems of the year, and if you've got an ear for the snarlier side of punk, these gals more than have you covered. It's everything I look for in a good punk album. Obnoxious, bratty, and twisted, but also very skillfully played, written, and performed. It's the best of both worlds. Yeah, it'll piss off some fedora-clad neckbeard jagoffs on Reddit or whatever bullshit, but in my book, hell, that only counts as bonus points towards their final score. Fuck yeah, you want some good ass punk music? You pick Warriors right the fuck up. Oi! Bellin! Bob's your uncle, you piss taut something git! No, 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 I promised my British audience I wouldn't do that. Uh, Dom is actually in the States now, so he could actually track me down and finish the job if he really wanted to. Uh, anyway, Idols. You're probably seeing this album show up on a lot of people's year-end lists, aren't you? Well, you should be, because man, if you want to kick open the door and make a loud, bombastic, earth-shattering first impression, this album right here, this is how you do it. Brutalism is an absolute cudgel of a record. Raw and venomous, it's an assault full of rampaging guitars, explosive percussion, and Joe Talbot's vocals, which aren't so much singing as they are chunks of asphalt being flung at you with a jackhammer. And this hailstorm of an outer package is all brilliantly accentuated by some surprisingly well-written, insightful, and ferociously charged lyrical content that might slip by you on the first listen if you aren't paying close attention. Though at this volume, how the hell could you not be paying attention? This is one of those artistically driven punk acts that really is a lot more capable and meaningful than they might appear on the surface, but whether you're here for a lecture or a rager, you'll get what you came for in this album. And maybe one or two good kicks to the face for good measure. Or to put it another way, well done! Oh my god, the new Trivium kicked ass. Oh my god, the new Trivium kicked ass. Oh my god, the new Trivium kicked so much ass. Ugh. Well, I personally have never really jumped off the Trivium train. Sycophantic little fanboy that I am. Trivium were starting to lose people over the last handful of albums they released. People were just not as warm to these guys as they used to be. Whether it be Matt Heafy changing up his vocal style or the guys delving into more catchy, radio-friendly styles of metal, these guys seem to maybe be losing their edge here and there, but on this album in particular, they roared back at their critics and naysayers and said, hey assholes, we haven't gone fucking anywhere. This album is a big return to form for these guys. Heafy's screams are back and they are so crushingly brutal, and the soloing on this thing is some of Heafy and Corey Ballou's best in years. This was an album that reminded you precisely why you became a Trivium fan in the first place, and it showed us a a newly focused, re-energized, and reinvigorated version of this band. This was a real Proving Grounds album for them. This album shows us that Trivium is just going to be one of those bands that we will be paying attention to for a very long time. Even if this dog does start to get old, she isn't about to start running out of tricks anytime soon. Oh, from this point on the list gets really hard to narrow down because 
at at least one point in the year, all five of these albums were front runners for album of the year. God, it was a brutal throwdown for the top spot this year. And given that this wonderful piece of deep fried vegan gold is sitting at only number five should clue you in as to just how good the top echelons of this list really are. <sighs> Seriously, can I just give out like five number ones? Is that something we can get away with? No? Oh, okay, fine. But yeah, Propagandi's latest absolutely slayed, an amazingly proficient and experimental record. This is punk for people with a prog mindset. It's complicated riffing and crazy shifts in tone and time signature, or something that would be criminalized in most punk chords, but these guys pull it off so goddamn well that you absolutely cannot charge them for it. And Su Lin Hago does an exquisite job of proving herself on this album. Seriously, a tour de force performance. For a newcomer to the band, I was seriously impressed with what she was laying down. Another absolutely scintillating album to add to an already lustrous catalog of work. Propagandi is another one of those bands that always delivers, and it's just really hard to have too much negative to say about these guys. Well, unless you're Don Cherry, maybe. Go out and get your own fair shake in oh, life and work Don, for it. Don't give me that stuff. Fuck, I love the Smith Street Band. Oh, I wish more of you knew about the Smith Street Band, especially after they released one of their best albums to date. Oh my God, this thing was stellar. Will Wagner is just one of my favorite goddamn lyricists of the last five years or so. His lyrics are so frank and nuanced, but strikingly personal and so vulnerable. You just feel absolutely everything he's trying to get you to feel, especially on this album. From the triumphant, drunk-ass sing-along of Death to the Lads, to the shy, dorky sincerity of birthdays, to the exhausted ennui of Run Into the World, these guys just know how to light your damn soul on fire. Like, if you dig on this album and like what you hear, then again, can't stress this enough, dive into that back catalog. For a band that hasn't even caught half of the fire they deserve, they already have a freaking astounding body of work, and I can only hope that it continues to keep growing from here. Guys, for the love of God, please take a trip to Smith Street. Again, with an album this fucking goddamn wonderful, I just hate, hate, hate that this can only be number three this year. But again, competition really was that stiff. So stiff that one of the best goth punk albums to be released, not just this year, but this entire bloody decade has to sit down the row from two other albums. Again, just because of its place on the list, please don't underestimate these guys. This is Black Gold. Look, you guys know me. I absolutely love me some spooky punk. Because I'm a spooky boy. And especially in a year where AFI took a great big old dump on the carpet, getting an album like this absolutely picked my spirits right the fuck back up. Wickedly insane guitar work, exquisite and elegant piano and keyboards, and a pair of powerhouse vocalists in Will Gould and Hannah Greenwood. This band is going to be doing big, big things in the future. Hell, you know a band is a hot ticket when you get bombarded by requests for them before they've even released anything. I got so many requests to review this band, apart from Remo Drive, Remo Drive, Remo Drive, Remo Drive! This was the band that got the most please review them crash out of any other band this year. But man... Y'all were 100% right with this one. Creeper is going to be huge, as long as they can keep this up. And I, for one, am giddy to see what's coming from them in the future. Oh, oh, let that black rain fall right over me. Ah, again, do you see how hard my choice was this year? An album came out this year that aligned so succinctly and perfectly to my tastes that I actually went to the trouble of christening it Crash Thompson the Album, and even it isn't good enough to win my album of the year. Uh Wow, 2017, you really were the strangest timeline, weren't you? Ugh. But man, 
this album did hold the top spot for a pretty long time, truth be told. In fact, I often bounced around when albums would come along and impress me, like Creeper or Propaganda, etc. But more often than not, I would always find myself coming back to this one. This record was pretty much my safe bets. The Menzingers have always had the passion, the heart, the soul, the charisma, the bravado to be great, but man, never has it all come together better than on After the Party. These are some of their catchiest hooks ever, their most passionate and thoughtful lyrics ever, their most relatable and down-to-earth narratives they've ever had the guts to write about. I mean, I think absolutely anyone who's around the ages of 23 to 35, you know, those goddamn dirty millennials that shitty business magazines keep writing hit pieces on, can identify with the heartbreak, the passion, and the struggle that this album constantly soliloquizes about. Man, if there's one other album apart from the number one pick I'd implore you to catch from 2017, this would truly be it. And you know what? I'm going to throw something down right now. The title track is totally my song of the year. Oh my God. This album may not get the top spot, but mother of all fucks, that title track is fucking amazing. Everybody wants to get famous, but you just want to dance in a basement. That is my fucking shit. Well, okay then, Crash Thompson. If Crash Thompson the album isn't Crash Thompson's album of the year, then what is? you cheeky fucking prick. Well, like I said, it was a battle royale throughout the entirety of 2017 that really came close, but the album that topped them all had that little extra spice, that little extra something, that little extra spark. Good God, a few years back when the Minesweep made my honorable mentions, I had a feeling that we'd be hearing more good stuff from these guys. They were a band that showed a lot of potential, but... Wow, I had no idea they were capable of stuff like this. Don't get me wrong, I expected the spark to be good, but it completely knocked me ass over tea kettle, back over ass with how good it was. People... This album is just... everything. This thing has everything I look for in an album of the year. It's full of passionate and intense performances. Lyrically, it's both bold, forceful, and politically charged, but also tender, vulnerable, and intelligent. It's snarky while sincere, complex yet easily accessible, a dramatic risk that feels like it resonates as vividly as the rest of their catalog. Guys! Like I said in my initial review, this album feels like Enter Shikari is achieving some kind of massively powerful, godlike final form. And you know, I'm the kind of guy that would know a thing or two about that. Take it from a Saiyan, I know this shit when I see it happening. And look, while Enter Shikari was a band always known for taking risks, even for them, this album was a gigantic experiment that could have failed horribly. Shikari have always been known for their sheer richness, density, and the overwhelming nature of their sound. On this album, they really played heavily against type and basically said, hey, you know what? Let's just make the polar opposite of an Enter Shikari record. They stripped things down, lost most of their heavier, rockier edge, and... Yeah, of course I can see that backfiring big time, especially in my book, but in keeping the melodies tight and laser focused, sanding down their hooks, beats, and choruses to the absolute highest gloss possible, and coating the album in an invigorating, intoxicating, lucid flavor of electronica and trance dynamics, these guys not only succeeded in making a good album outside of their comfort zone, They've pretty much built a masterpiece, an album that's inspiring, insightful, engaging, and at the end of the day, just a downright fucking blast to listen to. This was a record I simply could not stop spinning. Even to this day, it still gets so much airtime out of me. Fuck, I didn't think anything was going to top the Menzingers, but these guys came right the fuck out of left field and didn't so much surprise me or shock me as they did set me on fucking fire. 
then again, that's what sparks are supposed to do. So, hey, good fucking job, boys. For the love of God, keep this fire burning for me, okay? Holy shit. Enter Shikari. I didn't know you had it in ya. Whew, and that's the list. Thanks again for watching. Next up is actually the Game and Crash favorite and least favorite games of 2017 list. Hopefully that'll be up in the next week or so. But after that, we have lots of Patreon albums coming up, including stuff from Machine Head, Corrosion of Conformity, and Fallout Boy. Seriously? Oh, son of a bitch.